Ain't no thing like me, except me. <laughs> the maestro himself, Bradley Cooper. Hi, this is Karen from San Francisco. And this is Alex from Los Angeles, and welcome to Movie That Shaped Us. We are two longtime friends who grew up on opposite ends of the globe with very different backgrounds, but we're both shaped and are still being shaped by the movies we see and love. In this episode, we'll cover a filmmaker, actor, director, writer, etc., who shaped our love of film. And then we're back to actor, and this is Bradley Cooper, like you said, Karan. So why don't you tell listeners what your relationship is like with uh, Bradley Cooper? When did you first see him, and what do you think of him as an actor? Yeah, I was trying to think about that, because now he sort of feels very omnipresent in my mind. So it took me a little bit to figure out what when did I first encounter him, and I think it's sort of these side parts that he did. The wedding crashes part is sort of what I remember the most in right. kind of his early career. That's when I remember. That's when I, I think first met him. But it's really the hangover movies like everybody else where I really took note of him, mm-hmm. of this comedic actor who's handsome and edgy. And since then, yeah, you know, I've followed his career pretty much from being an actor to a movie star to being an actor to now an actor, director, and even mm-hmm. a performer. So it's been a really fun career, right, that he's been on. And, you know, it's we we as a society give shit to people who come off as, you know, tryhards or theater kids or what have you. And I think Bradley Cooper has some of that. But it's very sincere and earnest, and I appreciate that. And I'm very happy that, you know, he's been able to amass a pretty interesting, varied career. But yeah, how about you? When when did you first encounter him and what is your relationship to him? Yeah, similarly, definitely Wedding Crashers was the first time I remember being like, oh, this guy's really funny. He, yeah. Folks who haven't seen the movie or maybe haven't seen it in a while, he played Rachel McAdams' boyfriend. Total jerk, sort of like a preppy yeah yuppie asshole so he does a great job in that part that's what i remembered him from and then obviously the hangover he was a huge hit the first movie is fantastic really funny a seminal yeah. comedy the last 20 years and he's really good in it but he's not really playing the he's more like the straight man in that which that was interesting right. and then later i think i really started paying attention to him when he like few actors do try to become a writer director few actors do that and even fewer actually succeed and I think in seeing the stars, when I was like, wow, like he actually has some talent behind the camera too. He's more than just like a good looking guy who's funny in comedies and, you know, can obviously play other parts too. Like he has a lot of career that we'll get into when we break it down. But I think that's when I really started realizing, oh, is this sort of a more of a force, creative mm-hmm. force, as, as opposed to just being, you know, a popular actor who puts in good performances. And I actually just recently saw Maestro, which we'll get into a little bit at the end. I know you haven't seen it, so I won't get into it too much. But I think that movie definitely also is a very specific voice of a creative talent. So I think he could have some staying power here. I mean, I don't want to say like the next Clint Eastwood in terms of, I think he's the most successful actor to director that we've had. I don't think it's necessarily, we could say that yet, but he's definitely on a path to to having, I think a pretty interesting filmography as a writer director too, in addition to actor. So it's, it's very unique in the actors we've covered so far, at least in this podcast, where he's bringing in those other, he's a multi-hyphenate now. I think that's what makes him so, so unique and someone who I definitely will be watching moving forward. I agree. And it's kind of interesting. I know it's only made two movies and I haven't seen, like you said, Maestro, but it sort of feels like maybe this was his true calling, you Mm -hmm. know, to be in full control of the art that he's putting out there. Cause you know, he's made some really good movies as an actor, but Mm -hmm. You know, he's not the heartthrob Leo who then becomes an actor, actor. He's not, you know, the De Niro actor. He's not a methody kind of actor either. Right. He's kind of more, and he's not sort of the, you know, everybody's favorite Tom Hanks, likable right, guy right. A- actor either. So it's a very interesting career. He's sort of kind of more of a journeyman sort of actor, I think, mm-hmm. in a body of a leading man. Mm-hmm. Um who's had some hits, but also a lot of misses. And it's interesting that I think he's been more than anything a student, it feels like, of kind of Mm. art. It's great to see him kind of amass all this knowledge, working with great directors and such to now kind of, you know, do his own own thing, if you will. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think the theater kid energy is is strong in him and, and not only just as an actor, but just as a creative. And it's interesting to see him finding a lot of success, like critically and commercially. 
at least with Star is Born, and we'll see how Maestro does in both of those areas as it just came out or is slowly expanding yes. theatrically. But yeah, it's 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 interesting to see his funneling his energies into the, those projects, and I do feel like this is what he wants to do. It, it feels like this is not just a side thing like we just covered in no. our previous episode, That Thing You Do, which is Tom Hanks, writer-director, and he's directed, like I think, two films after That Thing You Do, but you could tell that was like something he just wanted to try, not that he had a passion for it, and what I think is coming across in Bradley Cooper's directorial and writing efforts is, no, this is what he wants to do. This is what is driving him, is having that full control over the entire project, not just being an actor in someone else's film. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so with that, we always kind of jump into the filmographies of the filmmakers we are covering. So there's some distinct phases in his career as mm -hmm. we were thinking about this or as I was thinking about it. So the first phase, kind of from 2001, Wet Hot American Summer, leading all the way up to the Hangover movie, the first mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And all of these roles basically are, you know, second, third lead parts. They are usually the antagonist or kind of the class clown, if you will, mm -hmm. or you know, somebody who's trying to sort of come in and bring in the third angle in the movie. The notable ones here for me are, of course, Wet Hot American Summer, which I love, and love he has movie. a great yeah. kind of bit part in it. Wedding Crash, as you already mentioned. Failure to Launch, which is not a good movie, but kind of fun, mm -hmm. you know, 2000s, you know, not so great uh, romantic comedy. Yes Man as well. I haven't seen all of them. And then he's just not that into you. Again, he's playing, I think you mentioned this when we were off mic, a handsome guy who's kind of an asshole mm -hmm. in some form or the other. Mm -hmm. But I will say he's always notable, you know? Like there are many actors who've done that and you either forget about them or they're distracting the movie. He's very much part of the movie. He's not noteworthy. And when you see him, you know that this guy has something. Right. But you know, it takes a bit for him to kind of really find what that something is because it's, you know, 10 years essentially almost from 2001 to 2009 till The Hangover comes up. But yeah, curious how you think about his first phase. Yeah, yeah. for me, the the standout performances were similar to you. Wet Hot American Summer was his first film. I think he works incredibly well in that. It's a very quirky comedy yeah. where he plays a kind of outlandish character. And then Wedding Crashers, like I mentioned at the outset, just so good at playing that preppy total asshole guy but it's interesting looking at all these films they are basically all comedies and he's all trying to yeah. play like a second fiddle a you know that good looking jerk guy and it's interesting that that is all that he sort of is doing it at this point leading into the hangover which is one that makes him a a superstar it is also a comedy but in that film what's so interesting which i do love that film the first one the other two are, yeah. are very quickly diminishing returns. I think the first right. one is a classic, like I mentioned earlier, of the 20th century, 21st century in terms of comedies. And he isn't playing the typical good looking jerk or kind of weird out there side character. He's a straight man in that movie, essentially, around this ensemble of, of other quirky characters. And I think that is what I think pushes him from just being a comedian side character to a, a you know getting leading man roles in the second phase which we'll get into is because in hangover he's playing the leading man he's he's leaning into the fact that yeah he's a good looking guy he can carry the movie but these crazy people surrounding him of ed helms and especially zach galifianakis right he they're they're so wacky and wild that he needs to be sort of like that the the, the oil in there or their water in their oil kind of like calming everything mm -hmm. down and having a character you could be following and, and relating to in the movie essentially he's mm -hmm. the straight man and I think that is a interesting turn on what he'd been doing before. Still a comedy, but he's not the one driving the comedy. He's the one who's the even keel in a film that's very wacky and out there. And very, I love The Hangover. The first movie's great. Yeah, the first movie's great. And that sort of is then, like you said, like the beginning of his second chapter. He is, you know, recognizable, bankable actor. This movie is a huge success, a, a huge giant. franchise. And it kind of starts his second phase of sort of, trying to be a movie star and there's you know a bunch of stuff in here most of it i want to say doesn't work except for i think limitless is probably his first sort of trial with like a dramatic intense role mm -hmm. that actually really lands and i mean this move this movie now has like a tv show and mm -hmm. so clearly it has like a cult following and i remember watching limitless at the time and 
seeing that, oh, so he can do this too, you know, because to your point, we knew him as a comedic actor, even though he's not a, you know, conventionally looking comedic actor, like right, he's a right. man type. So, but it takes a bit for him to kind of get to do this very intense kind of dark kind of in, intelligent, if you will, movie, which is limitless. So that's kind of the only, I think, bright spot in this second phase, which sort of ends with Silver Linings Playbook, and we'll get into that. But yeah, any thoughts on phase two of his? Were there any other movies that you actually liked or enjoyed in this, apart from The Hangover and Limitless? Yeah, n- no, actually. And I, even The Hangover 2, I didn't think worked very well. No. But it was interesting to see him you know, have a couple films in there, like Valentine's Day, all about Steve, where it's this, he's still in the, some of the talent of that comedic side character roles that Not he great. was doing before, sort of like before he tried to take a stab at the, the box office sort of leading man thing, which we have A-Team, which was his attempt at getting into a big franchise picture. That movie is terrible. Did not work at no, all. Not to his, you know, did, it wasn't him that didn't work. The entire movie just doesn't work at all. It was a, it was a flop. So then I think he moved away kind of from that big budget franchise stuff. I mean, we'll, we'll get into the MCU in a bit, but he moved away from that big budget franchise stuff. He played it safe with Hangover 2, but he is starting to try out some other like Limitless, the words, and then, and then the obviously- The words is actually not bad. Right, right. He's pretty good in it, I think. Yeah, he's trying to like stretch, you know, his his leading madness now that he has it because of the hangover. But it's really Civil Lines playbook which sort of ends this phase and gets into the next one, which I think is a big turning point for him for sure. Why don't, why don't you start talking about that film and then I'll, then I'll get into my thoughts, which I, I do like the film a lot. Yeah, I like that film a lot too. And I think he finds a pretty great pairing with David or Russell who, you know, as a person just seems like a horrible person to be around. But, you know, this is sort of the golden phase of David or Russell. These movies that are, you know, dramatic, they're intense, but they're also comedies, but they're very kind of improvisatory in their performance style. He's very known for that. And, And I think this pairing of Bradley Cooper, Jennifer Lawrence, who's also this huge rising star at that time with veterans like De Niro, it's like mm-hmm. a great kind of ensemble piece, which I think uses Bradley Cooper's comedic chops for sure, because he's playing this character who's, you know, probably on the spectrum and is dealing mm-hmm. with a lot of mental health issues and such. And, you know, there is some kind of, you know, human comedy that comes out of that. But it's also a chance for Bradley to kind of show his dramatic chops. You know, he's given a lot to kind of play with and bounce off these amazing actors and I think he finds himself as an actor a little bit and that's why this movie is seminal it's his first best actor nomination and Mm -hmm. kind of starts this third phase of his career of him you know really working with big name directors and kind of honing his craft as a dramatic actor any other thoughts on this phase or even this movie yeah I think the movie's great like I said I as as much as David Russell sounds like a horrible person in real life. Yeah. I do like most of his films and we'll go out and see whatever new picture he he puts out. And this, I think, was a great use of Bradley Cooper in this role too. It is a lot of comedic stuff in it, but also a lot of very serious things. And I do feel that him getting the best actor nomination in this mm-hmm. role puts him all of a sudden in a different category of like, okay, well, he's not just that crazy, you know, a, a side hangover character in a comedy. Dude. He's not the hangover guy where he's trying to just be in big sort of like mainstream hits and go after the box office. No, like he's an actual actor who should now be given more meteor performances. And I do think he does a great job in this film too. Yeah. It's not, it's definitely a very well-earned best actor nomination that it really starts this, this next phase of his career, which starts after this film is one of just a lot of critical acclaim in, in his acting too. I mean, he gets another nomination pretty soon sh- shortly after this, but I, I do think this is a great film and also a seminal one for Bradley Cooper for sure. Yeah. But in classic Bradley Cooper fashion, you know, and I relate to that personally, that sometimes when you're, I don't know, earnest or you care about stuff way too much and you get that big break, which is sort of the beginning of that new chapter things don't go always this plan. And I think this has happened to him a lot, right? That Mm -hmm. in the second phase with Hangover, that's the only bright spot. Nothing else really works. Mm -hmm. And in this phase too, there are a few bright spots like American Hustle is gets a second nomination, like you mentioned with Mm -hmm. David Russell. But the movie 
at the moment is kind of a big thing, but it's sort of forgotten pretty quickly. Like this right. is not a movie people really remember. I think the other big bright spot in this is his collaboration with Clint Eastwood with American Sniper. I still remember that movie just came out of nowhere. Mm. It was, you know, a December release made like a over a hundred million dollars. He's a leading man. He does a great job. He bulks up for it. This is his first kind of transformational role. And I think we'll get to his last phase, but a lot of him learning about direction and he gets producer credit on this movie as well, comes mm -hmm. from this collaboration with Clint Eastwood. But the rest of this, these choices of like Aloha and Burnt and Joy and, you know, War Dogs, they are all, you know, projects that were hard to get out like burnt had been kind of lying around in fact i believe fincher was supposed to make it at one point so he i think so of, yeah yeah got it out and kind of got it done used his movie star status to do that aloha is just you know cameron crow trying to kind of get back at cameron crow magic and sort of failing at it completely Serena, same thing. Like all of these are on paper, probably good choices, but they don't pan out. Yeah, I mean, I think he's trying to, after getting that best actor nomination and, and things going so well with working with a yeah. top tier director like David O. Russell, he's trying to work with other of those big directors, Clint Eastwood successfully, and then yeah. obviously uh, Cameron Crowe less successfully. Even going back to to David O. Russell a couple times are diminishing returns too. Right. With, American Hustle and then Joy. I mean, it's it's still not really, really working for him. And then the couple other projects he does outside of this, other than American Sniper, just don't really seem to work. But I, I do think in this in this phase, the American Sniper piece is the most important, not only because it was, again, a gigantic hit commercially and critically, but I think that producer Oscar nomination too just sort of yeah. shows that he's a force to be reckoned with on the business side of things. And I'm sure helped him kind of get The Star is Born, his first directorial effort out I mean, personally, I have a lot of issues with the film. I don't, I don't, I don't like it. I mean, it's hard for me to separate, you know, my feelings on that, you know, homicidal maniac in that, right. that real life person who is, I think, a total scumbag. It's yeah. separating him, that from what the film is doing. But I think his performance is interesting and very, very understated. And he's giving more, I think, humanity to the person than the actual person did. I think the performance is more human than, than what that guy actually was and what that guy actually did. Totally. But and it is a screenplay form. too, which is not very good. Right. Uh, but the guy who wrote it, I remember watching interviews of him. But yeah, I think it's it's him, Cooper, and then of course Clint Eastwood. What Eastwood brings to it for yeah. sure. And then I think just another important you know role that to bring up in, in this phase that he gets into is his voice work. I, we start yeah. off the the episode with a quote of Rocket Raccoon, but the voice work in Guardians of the Galaxy. This was playing a animated character, Rocket Raccoon, who was a character who was not famous uh, outside of comics he wasn't like a character like the hulk or spider-man or people didn't really know who he was and i think there's a lot of interesting backstory to that character too and pathos to rocket who we see him evolve over the three guardians of the galaxy films and i think a lot of the heart of those movies are all based around rocket story especially in the third one and a lot of that is due to what bradley's able to bring in the vocal performances of this character who has a, a very strong edge and, and a shield that he puts up of like being cocky. A lot of like his, maybe his, his earlier roles, like in wedding crashers, but there's a, there's a lot of the wounded soul behind that. Right. And I think you can hear that in a lot of what he, he puts in that character. And now he's one of the most popular Marvel characters. And a lot of that is due not only to James Gunn, just doing a fantastic job with all three of those guardian films, but a lot of it is due to Bradley Cooper's performance as rocket. He, he brings like a, an attitude to that, that little raccoon and a pathos that I do think it's incredible voice work that I want to give him credit for in this phase too. I agree. And also a smart choice, right? Like, okay. The MCU stuff is like booming. Mm-hmm be part of it but do it in a voice work kind of way so that your physical persona is not totally taken over by marvel mm -hmm. right like if you are a chris evans or chris hemsworth or any of the chris's like what else are you gonna go and do like this True. is how, what people see you they see you in the suit right whereas this is a voice character so you don't see Bradley Cooper. So I think it was, I don't know if it was calculated in that sense, or not, but it's a very smart move that, you know, gets him in the mainstream conversation, obviously pays the bill as well, mm -hmm. you know, maintains his movie star status without kind of 
the quote unquote evils of being trapped in the MCU where you just become like a one trick person, you know, and then this launches his final phase that we are in now, which is this, this phase of a multi hyphenate Mm -hmm. of him directing and acting and it starts with a star is born, which I think is an absolute, I don't want to use the word masterpiece because it's used a lot, Mm -hmm. but it's pretty close. I don't think anybody expected what this movie is going to be like. I don't think anybody expected a whole bunch from Bradley Cooper. You know, this subject matter has been done before many, many times to varying degrees of success. Gaga being like an interesting choice for the movie and the Mm -hmm. movie just comes in blaring and is a critical darling, a huge commercial success. And you really see his hand, you know, across the board. And I think this is when he really comes to his own fully, if you will. Still, there is that try hardness to it because he's doing a lot, right? Like this, the accent, the transformation, <laughs> he's right. singing, he's directing. Like this movie is very showy, you know, in all the best ways possible. What a, what a, we haven't had actually that many kind of actors transforming into directors with such a bang in recent times. And he definitely gets the cake for it. And it's almost like I can see him, I don't know, snickering from the corners. Cause I don't think people expected that. No, I, I think you're, you're right in the sense that coming out of the gates with this, there's either sort of two ways it can go. Oh, it's a yeah. one trick pony. It was just one thing. And he was successful at that. And he's never going to be able to capture that again. Or this is the beginning of a career. That's going to be very, long and interesting career in terms of what he's going to output as a multi-hyphenate now as a writer director also star and i think this movie works fantastically well i mean i Mm -hmm. I also think it's a great film do a lot to his direction his act he's great performance in this this movie Um, uses lady gaga in in a way that really works she's fantastic in it it's a it's just a it's a it's a it's a wonderful film that is has been like you said done so many different times and I haven't seen all the different versions of of A Star Is Born, but I've seen but I, most of them. and I'm sure there'll be another one in ten years. Yeah, but this one I think will hold a special a place just in the the versions of this of this tale, and a lot of that is due to him. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's also interesting, right, that he goes back and makes a movie that is very old Hollywood style, right? From the story to how it's put together, uh-huh. you know, it has a lot of kind of gravitas to it, as opposed to you know, an actor of today's times could have gone out and made any movie, you know, as Mm -hmm. opposed to maybe making a movie of this kind that we all say, oh, they don't make him like this anymore. Mm -hmm. This movie is definitely in that. And then the fact that it's good and does well at the box office. A huge hit, yeah. Huge hit, kind of amazing. And I think that again goes to the credit to him that it's made a good movie. But to your point, like cast, casting Gaga, I think was critical because she brings like a whole other, you know, band of fans to the movies and mm-hmm. establishes her as a, you know, as an actress, as a movie star, if you will. We haven't seen, you know, Cher was the last person who had that kind of an arc and now it's Gaga. So right. know, again, credit goes to her, uh, goes to him really. So yeah, so that starts chapter four. Mm-hmm. We are in that chapter right now. I think I have to mention Licorice Pizza, which is one of my <laughs> favorites of PTAs. And it's sort of the classic, you know, movie star performance by Bradley Cooper in this movie that, okay, I'm there now. Yeah. I am your multi hyphenate actor, director. I'm Warren Beatty. And I'm going to go and do this ridiculous, over the top, but amazing part, a bit part in this movie, which is amazing and kind of steal the movie, if, if you will. Like he came pretty close to getting another supporting actor nomination for yeah. this movie. He's so good in it. The movie is amazing, but what a turn, right? Like yeah. kind of to tell people, if you will, that I'm still here, you know, right. I, I can do this too. Right. And also sort of not take himself too seriously in the sense right. of, Oh, I'll come in and do a bit part plain outlandish version of John Peters. who is a real life guy in yeah. a movie of another you know, major director instead of think, oh, I, I was nominated for best picture, best actor, best screenplay. I'm I'm not gonna be- lower myself down to doing essentially like a trumped up cameo in an, in someone else's movie playing this really crazy part. 
I think that shows humility in, in a way of like, no, I'll come back and, you know, I'll do the small little part, even though I'm now trying to create this other career for myself as a small to hyphen it. I think that's super, super cool that, that he did that and a great job yeah. in, the, in the movie too. So great funny. job. It's both things though, you know, it's humility, but there's still a try hardness to it. Cause you know, he could have <laughs> gone and done like a subdued part or like a lesser showy part, but this uh-huh. is a very showy part in a movie that's, you know, pretty even killed and, and kind of muted if you will. And then there's Nightmare Alley, which I know mm. you love a lot. Mm-hmm. I think he's great. And especially the last, you know, 20 minutes of the movie, that performance and that scene is kind of, in the pantheon of the best acting performances that I've, I've seen in the last, you know, 10, 15 years. But it's once again him carrying on with, I guess, a little bit of phase three or working with noteworthy directors. Exactly, and, right. You know, Guillermo del Toro. But mm-hmm. also, I guess there is humility in that because famously this part was rejected by DiCaprio and he steps in and does it, mm-hmm. but does a great job at it. So I'm glad that we have that in this phase. Yeah, yeah, me too. And and also just uh, in this phase as well, he so he was nominated for Best Picture producing Star is Born, but also gets two other nominations at, at, for Best Picture because he produced Joker and then right. also Nightmare Alley, like you mentioned. And I think this is really showing that he is is becoming a major creative force on the business side and not right. just in front of the camera. And it's helping to continue to grow that part of his career, which leads into his latest film that just came out Maestro, where again, he's writer or co-writer director, actor, and producer as well. Like he's, he's bringing everything to the table and it, we won't get into the movie too much. Cause I'm sure a lot of people haven't seen it. Karan, you haven't seen it yet, but for me, the movie works to a lesser degree on the directing side, but on the performance side, absolutely transformative like you don't think that this is bradley cooper do, doing this he fully envelops the character not the, the, the not the character because it's a real life person of leonard bernstein but you feel like this is a you're looking at leonard bernstein and you never think about this being a performance it just feels so like true to life and totally you lose bradley cooper's like gone from it entirely at least that's my experience in the film versus the other performances where he yes gets nominated and does a great job you still feel like okay this is bradley cooper in this role as in star is born or silver linings playbook or even in nightmare alley it's still bradley cooper but in this you almost forget that it's that it's him the acting is is, at, is out of this world and really just worth the price of admission just to see his performance in this and it'll be very interesting to see how this does commercially and critically mm-hmm. as it gets rolled out it's gonna be a very competitive season this year especially in the actor category for oscars but i think he's gonna be in there for sure like i don't think it's yeah. you can deny what he's doing here and i think it's exciting to see him take another it's a more bold choice a lot of things he does as a film with with a director so he's pushing himself he's growing and i i'm excited to see what he's gonna be doing next yeah no i haven't seen the movie like you said but it's a pretty bold move for him as a second picture to take material mm-hmm. like this. And it's also interesting to see that how his multi-hyphenate status is kind of pushing him as an actor too, because I would think that it would be the reverse, right? That if you're now a director and a producer, you're probably, you probably want to take it a little bit easier on the acting side, perhaps, right. you know? Right, right. The fact that he's stretching himself and to your point, like this is his first like full transformation it's kind of amazing and then just like watching interviews of him kind of working with the Bernstein family and the estate and the children and and the fact that he was such a passionate about music and classical music and Mahler and conducting like it's so interesting to me to kind of think that this is the hangover dude Mm -hmm. who's playing Bernstein and has (laughs) had this love for Mahler and conducting his whole life like it's so fascinating to see this whole kind of arc of his career and and like you said I think we're seeing somebody really come into his own can't wait to watch the movie and it seems like this is going to be a creative force that's going to be with us hopefully for a long time to come like like the Warren Beatty's and the Clint Eastfoods of the world Mm -hmm. but also putting his own signature take on it because those guys were all you know, matinee idols or movie stars and people were falling for him. I don't think Bradley has that kind of an arc. Like he's been 
an actor, sort of a movie star, known figure, but not, you know, a poster child. He's no Brad Pitt or any of those people. Right. But the fact that he's carved this newly found kind of creative force, you know, maestro status through all those kind of, the assemblage of those bit materials is pretty amazing. Actually, we don't have a comp for him. Right. I think it's interesting too, that he quickly will went after that, this multi-hyphenate path. Like he didn't wait to establish himself as a movie star. I mean, he is a movie star, but not to the wattage of a Clint Eastwood or, or Warren Beatty at their, at their heights for sure. But like you said, like Eastwood had a huge, he was a giant star before he started getting into the, 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 the directing and then, you know, continue to do that as he got older, but Cooper's seen more to be running towards this path of this is what he wants to do. He doesn't want to just yeah. be contained to be an actor. And okay, I'll try out directing and writing and let's see kind of what this is. It seems to me like this is something he was trying to do for a long time. Cause he ran right at it. He didn't give himself a little bit of time to marinate in that phase where he was trying to yeah. become, uh, you know, a, a critically acclaimed actor. It's a, it's very, very interesting. So speaking yeah. of the future, what what would you like to see Bradley do? This is what we do in every one of these episodes. Play their agent or w- what we want as an audience member. What, what do we want to see out of Bradley in the in his future, in his next phase? What, uh, what, what, what is it for you? Yeah, you know, this is a hard one because we haven't done multi-hyphenates before. Where my instinct goes is that because his roots are comedy, mm-hmm. I would love for him to direct and star in a comedic movie, you know, like he's like, he's tried to take on heavy subjects to really establish himself as uh, an actor, director, producer, Uh which makes sense. It's paid off really well, but I would love for him to, you know, make a comedy, maybe set in a period time. So you can still really see the filmmaking and all Mm. of that at play, but have like a comedic bent to it, you know, something wacky, on the lines of hangover, but with some gravitas. I feel like he can do that. Oh, a uh, a, a period hangover. That actually sounds like a pl- a movie pitch that 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 it is formulating. Like imagine it's uh it's a carriage ride in the English countryside, and someone <laughs> gets you know too too drunk on I don't know what they used to drink about then mead or uh, maybe I'm confused with a lot of different uh, <laughs> historical time periods. But I, I like that as a pitch. We should develop that offline so no one steals it. <laughs> But for me, it's interesting, especially after seeing Maestro, where so much of this movie to me was in just an incredible performance that he gives. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see what he would do if he wasn't starring in the movie and he was directing other actors and 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 oh, helped them kind of be the star of the show. I mean, in it's Star is Born, you know, he is the co-lead, but Gaga has her own persona that she's coming to the table with. And, you know, he does a great job in obviously channeling that and it, it works really well in their chemistry and in maestro carrie mulligan's the co-lead and she does a great job but she's also a fantastic actress but he does in my opinion sort of like steal the show even in the scenes with them together i just would love to see what he could do when he wasn't also acting and also mm-hmm. taking up that space in the picture and what what he's like as a director just purely as a director or screenwriter so i and when I'm, I'm sure at some point he will do this i mean honestly maybe the reason why he hasn't yet is because he wants to establish himself as a director and he needs him as an actor to get the pictures financed because Bradley Cooper, you know, pulls in some, you know, is, is a name, pulls in some some bodies and maybe he can't attract high caliber acting talent yet as he, as a director. So he's trying to prove himself perhaps, but I, that's what I'd love to see him continue on, focus more on directing. I think that's where now, as after seeing after seeing this movie, I'm more interested in what he does next as as a director. Even though, like I said, the movie didn't really work for me much on on his directing side, but he definitely has a, a specific point of view he's trying to get out with his last two films. So that that's what I'd love to see him do. Yeah, I agree. I mean, excited to see what he does next. I love that idea of him not being in his own movie. But we really hope you enjoy this episode and check out Maestro in theaters. Sounds like recommended viewing in theater as opposed to on Netflix. Yes, yeah. If you can, ch- if it's playing in a, in your local area or if it's on Netflix, definitely check it out. With that, as always, we are available on all podcast platforms, including YouTube, where you can find reviews of each of our movies. Please rate and review us, and don't forget to subscribe, as that all that really helps listeners find us. And with that, we'll see you next time. Goodbye. I just wanted to take another look at you. <laughs> I just sound I sound like Trump impression. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs>